Startup Nation, we tell you all the time that no one does anything great on their own. That includes starting a business or a nonprofit or even becoming a thought leader or an influencer. My point is that you need a team to do it successfully and responsibly. And that is why you should contact DR and Associates. Danielle and her team provide branding solutions along with digital and social media marketing that provide tangible results you are looking for. No matter if you are a Fortune 500 company or an author looking to make an impact, DR and Associates needs to be part of your team. They are one of the few firms whose leadership has been recognized by Google, which is proof of concept that they are very good at what they do. Contact DR and Associates today to grow your online presence. The number is 615-933-3681, or you can visit their website at drandassociates.com. Also, make sure you follow their Facebook page as well. DR and Associates, providing real clients with real results. This week on The Startup Life. I sat down one day and I said, oh my God, I need, I need to start this business. I need to do a business. Okay. And I've been looking at another option, completely away from seasoning. Sure. Although I've been talking to him about all the speed seasonings I wanted to do, mm-hmm. but I thought about another business and said, oh, if I did this, it could bring way, it could bring money much faster and I think it's going to do really well. And looked at me and said, why? And of course I gave all these reasons about money and he goes, that's not your passion. I'm like, of course it is. He said, no, it isn't. And I'm going to ask you today, and I'm going to say it again. Lenora, you spoke to me about spices for years. Do it. All right, Startup Nation. So let's take flight with Lenora Ebula, founder of Balin Spice. The startup life begins now. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> oh, this you crazy mother... The Startup Life is brought to you by Target. No matter if it's household items to make your home more aesthetically pleasing or a 65 inch TV to complete that man cave, Target is the go-to place for high quality products at an affordable price. Start your Target journey with a link in our show notes. Target, expect more, pay less. All right, Startup Nation, so I hope you're ready to see some value today. We got a big time guest in the building today. We have Lenora Uble, am I saying that right? Ebola. Ebola. Lenore Ebola of Balin Spice. What's going on, El Boogie? I'm doing really well, thank you. How are you? I can't complain. I can't complain. Enjoying this beautiful Memphis weather here in the office in downtown Memphis. Are you ready to pour some knowledge in the Startup Nation today? Absolutely. All righty. Let's do it. As always, my name is Dominic Lawson. This is the Startup Life Podcast, and it is powered by the Bench Podcast Network. So first things first, El Boogie. Tell us about your origin story. Share with us your path of entrepreneurship. Yes. So um, I actually started off working in the corporate world, mm-hmm. and I actually still do. Okay. But I have this passion for food and mm. really delicious food. So I looked at it as growing up, like from very, very young, all my fondest memories were around the kitchen or the dining table. And I remember like the really good foods my grandma would make. Okay. And just looking back at what it is she used, they had a bit of spices. So I moved from Cameroon, which is in Central West Africa, okay. out to England, okay. and I had a wide array of friends mm-hmm. from all around like North, South, East Africa, as well as um, Europeans. Okay. And we would take the same chicken and cook it with different spices, and it would taste so different. Mm-hmm. Same chicken out of the store, tasting ridiculously differently. So it kind of gave me that thought that spices was the core to really good food. And it really made a difference in, of course, how we all came together and enjoyed our foods. So that's what sparked the interest for spices. So when I moved over to the U.S., I found that I could not see quite easily the spices I used. So the spices my grandma used, the spices my friends um, in England used, I couldn't find them quite easily. And that's when I realized there's a group of people out there like me who want to have delicious food healthy tasting food right. without a lot of the salt, the GMOs, but from other places. And I found I could not see them easily in the US. Same thing I couldn't find them easily in England. And so I decided if there's people out there like me, there must be other people out there who are looking for good spices. 
and that's how I started talking to people are they interested in spices what would they like and I found there was a big interest in seasonings and healthy spices from Africa all around the continent right. and I thought good opportunity to get into Right. It's funny you mention that because like when I go to my neighborhood grocery store and stuff like that and you go on the international aisle, right? You usually see Asian stuff, you know, Mexican stuff, you know, Hispanic stuff, but you don't see a lot of anything outside of those two things. So I imagine going down that aisle was probably like you said, probably quite frustrating. Yes. For sure. Yes, For yes. Sure. I mean, there are places you can find some African seasonings. Of course. They're going to be like the Caribbean stores, which are not national mm -hmm. brands. Right. So I could not, for example, I can't leave Memphis and go to Maryland and find the same in the Caribbean store. Right. Selling the same seasonings. While if you went into a Walmart and looked for your favorite uh, say Indian spice, you can see that in almost any Walmart around the country. Right. So there is that consistency for all the seasonings, but there isn't for the African seasonings, for the African spices. Gotcha. And I see a huge opportunity, okay. not just for me, but for tons of people who love unique and new flavors. Gotcha. So I want to go back to something you said, Lenora. You was talking about how your deepest, fondest memories are around food. Yes. And, you know, you know, sitting at the dinner table with like family and friends and, and stuff like that. Tell me a little bit more about that. Why is it that, you know, in your opinion, where people have this, you know, affinity for food and it brings about, and it's like for many people, it's not just about sustaining life. It's about like these memories that we have. Just share some, you know, some stuff about that a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. My mother is from a large family. Okay. Yeah, she has eight brothers and sisters. There's mm -hmm. nine of them. And we would, like almost once a year, try to have Christmas with the big family. Gotcha. And I remember so well going down to my grandparents' place. This was in 2010, maybe, yeah, 2010. And had my grandma, my granddad, and I'll say about eight or so, nine of my, my mom's brothers and sisters with their kids, and it was for Christmas. And I remember so well my grandma just cooking and cooking nonstop. Mm. The food was delicious. But then we had not seen each other for years. I was living in England, my cousins were living in other places. And so we came back and we just bonded. Mm. We just spent days talking, eating. And it was, I mean, it's one of the best memories I have. Not and bad. my grandfather unfortunately passed not mm. long after that. Sorry to hear that. that that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he passed not long after that. And so just remembering that time with them and remembering how most of our conversations were on the table, or just after breakfast or after lunch, but sitting there with food you're right beside us, and right. just bonding and talking. Right. It's, it's one of my really fondest memories. I, I hear that, and, and the yeah. reason I asked that question, Startup Nation, and thank you for sharing all of yeah. that. The reason I asked that question, Startup Nation, because a lot of times when we're in our businesses and we're creating a product, you know, whether it be Balin Spice or something else, you know, we're not necessarily creating a product the actual product, you know, at the surface, we're creating or recreating memories. Yes. We're recreating uh, nostalgia. We're re recreating, you know, good times with family and friends and stuff like that. And so that's often goes into how we brand stuff, how we market stuff. So I appreciate you sharing that for sure, because I know a lot of people, like I said, have a deep affinity, you know, with memories of brown food and stuff like that. So yeah. I appreciate that. So I, I want to ask you this because I know you. You know, you say you work in corporate America and stuff like that. And I saw that you used to do some work at McCormick. Yes. Right. Which is, you know, you know, salt peppers and stuff like that. What is something that you've learned that you learned there that you use in your business today? I say a lot. OK. <laughs> OK. So McCormick. So the, the role I had at McCormick was the first. It was, it was not my first um, consumer package group role, but the first in food. OK. And. I learned very quickly that um, doing draperies, which is what I did before, okay. drapery hardware and all stuff like that, Got it. it's very different from getting a product in front of people on a shelf and wanting them to walk past and stop and look at it and go, hmm, maybe I want to taste this. And so I learned packaging. I learned design. I learned how to understand the consumer, mm. what they say and what they do not say. Absolutely. Because if you ask people questions, what do you want? They'll tell you what they want based on what they know. But some of the things they leave out gives you insight as to what they may truly be looking for. Understanding what their challenges are helps you understand how to identify that need and how to go after that need. And by that, I mean not packaging and promoting your product to target that particular consumer mm. and what the challenges are. 
Thank so you. I'll say I learned all of that before my comic. I mean, it's a great company to work for. For sure. Absolutely great team. For sure. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Before you decided to, you know, to dive in and create Balin Spice mm-hmm. and Startup Nation, you can go to the show notes. We have a link to Balin Spice in the show notes for easy access for you to check out those amazing spices that you've created uh, for the company. But before you decided to make Balin Spice and you knew, you know, when you went to the supermarket and you went down the international aisle and you didn't see those type of African spices and stuff like that, did you think about uh, doing a, a different type of business? Did you think about a restaurant? Did you think about uh, or, or something else? Was it always spices for you? It, it was has always all... been spices. Okay. Yeah, so I've been thinking about bail and spice. Well, not calling it bail and spice, but just spices. Well, sure. For years. Okay. Well before, I can't even think of how long it's been at the back of my mind. So mm-hmm. I've been thinking about how do we get spices, flavorings that recreate a lot of foods I ate gotcha. into, into a mass market. For years. Gotcha. I just hadn't put pen to paper. For like, sure. Taking my thoughts and like to build it out in a business plan. What, what was the deciding factor? What was the moment that Lenora was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. <laughs> share, share, share that I with will, you. I will. I will. I will. My spouse is not going to be very happy about this. Uh-oh. I'm going to tell you the story. Uh-oh. So... <laughs> I sat down one day and I said, oh my God, I need, I need to start this business. I need to do a business. Okay. And I've been looking at another option completely away from seasonings. Sure. Although I've been talking to him about all the speed seasonings I wanted to do, mm-hmm. but I thought about another business and said, oh, if I did this, it could bring way, it could bring money much faster and I think it's going to do really well. And he looked at me and said, why? And of course I gave all these reasons about money and he goes, that's not your passion. And I go, of course it is. He said, no, it isn't. And I'm going to ask you today, and I'm not going to say it again. Lenora, you've spoken to me about spices for years. Do it. Mm. And of course, we had this like little back and forth, and it's like, babes, I'm asking you to do it. I went, okay. And so two days later, I like wrote ideas down on a piece of paper. And I came to him and said, see, I told you. <laughs> and that was what got me going. Okay. Because I had been thinking about it and talking to him so much about it, but I hadn't taken a step to do it. Mm. And I'm looking at something completely different. And what I appreciate most is that he put his foot down and said, you can do this. You've spoken to me so many times. Just do it. Right. And so once I started talking and writing it down, it just flowed. And I haven't looked back since. I hear that. I hear that. Thank you for sharing that. So when you decided to start the business and you know get into spices and stuff like that, because the thing is you're in the the food space, which yes. you know. So talk to me and Startup Nation about some of those health standards that you have to you know adhere to and stuff like that in the food space, because a lot of times mm-hmm. you know there's many people who have ideas for to be a foodpreneur, whether it be spices, a restaurant, a food truck, and stuff like that, yeah. and it's different from when you're cooking at home for your family as opposed to the public. Yes. Provide, so talk about those standards and walk me through that process of adhering to those standards. If absolutely, you would. absolutely. Mm-hmm. So um, the first one is making sure it's packaged in a sanitary environment. Okay. So I use a co-packer. Okay. So um, right now I would not bottle stuff myself because I don't have the approval to do that in my own facility. Gotcha. So I use a co-packer. Okay. I also um, source my seasonings from about three or four different suppliers. Okay. I went through a process of looking for unique flavors that were number one were healthy. Mm-hmm. high grade ingredients and did not have any of like no salt no GMOs so not blended with anything um, genetically modified for sure and 100% organic not organic but 100% natural ingredients so I found different suppliers who met those standards got it I then found a separate um, co-packer who blend who now blends my seasonings and then packages them with all the requirements that the FDA requires so they actually have all these certifications and I work with them to make sure my products are compliant. Gotcha. In, in terms of the, the labeling and all that, again, I ensure that all my labels are compliant with um, the requirements. Mm-hmm. So it does have a nutritional label on it. It, talks, it gives you the right nutrition information on the labels. Gotcha. So if there's, a, if there's any salt in it, which 99% of my seasonings do not. Okay. It would tell you how much salt is in it. Okay. Yep. And then, um, of course, I try to put as much, I'll say, visual appeal 
telling you what's in the seasoning. So all the ingredients are listed. Every single piece of it is listed. Mm -hmm. And you can see some images of those ingredients as well gotcha. on the label. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So I go to baleandspice.com and I see that you have a blog. Yes. And so I, I went and checked it out. And it's, it's Africa, five fun facts. What made you write that blog? <laughs> or have that blog on the website because I think somebody else may have written it for you. No, 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 actually, oh, okay. I, okay. I, I, I do my own blogs. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes. So the find the five fun facts. It was just uh, it was more level setting. Okay. Yes. So we hear Africa. We see what's on TV, and it's it's very mixed messaging. Mm. It I find it very mixed. I grew up in Cameroon, and what I see on TV is not a representation of what I know. Gotcha. And I think and speaking to a lot of people, people ask why Africa. So, so I, I do demos, and in, in demoing the products, I actually just ask people questions. What do you think about the labeling, the product name? Is there anything that crosses your mind? Because I'm trying to get as much information sure. from people who buy as uh, possible. Sure. And some people ask me, why Africa? Oh, and someone even said to me once, but are there wars there all the time? And I went, um, maybe. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. No, it isn't. So, there is a, so there's a lot of mixed messaging about what's happening on the continent. Sure. And I thought it would be really interesting just to level set. Hey, we're just like every other country. Not a continent. Cameroon, for example, is just like any other country. Right. The continent is just like any other continent. Things happen. Here's some fun things that happen. Things you may not, you may not know about. But, hey, they're quite interesting coming from the continent. A completely different lens from what you normally see on TV. Right. We appreciate that. So it's funny you mention all of that because one person that I admire as an economist is uh, Dambisa Moyo from Uganda. Mm -hmm. and, and so she was on a, a program a while back and she talked about how the West here in the United States, stuff like that, you know, Western Europe, stuff like that, does a lot of like aid to mm -hmm. Africa and stuff like that. But it hinders growth. It hinders yeah. trade and stuff like that. And so I, I think about that, and I'm actually going to play a clip for Startup Nation so they can kind of, you know, provide that context. It reminds me of another report that I saw that, like, places like China, Japan, Brazil, and other places, and American businesses, not at the mm -hmm. government level, but American yeah. businesses are actually starting to make viable investments into Africa, right? Not like yeah. just aid, but like investments for trade. And stuff like that. I just want to get your take on that. Like, wh what do you think yeah. about all of that? Um, like, why, I, why, why is the United States kind of falling behind other places, you know, as far as trying to build up Africa as opposed to just hinder it with aid? I don't think any, this is my opinion, I don't think sure. any nation should help. And I'm not saying not help, but look, right. let, let me put it this way. Sure. I don't think it's any nation's responsibility to bring another nation up. I think we are all responsible for putting policies in place to make sure we have we're sustainable, we're viable, and we can grow economies. Sure. So I do completely agree with the economies you spoke about. Mm -hmm. I think aid hinders us mm -hmm. significantly. Right. Give me an opportunity to trade on an equal footing, and we will grow. However, we, are, on the other hand, have to ensure that we create the conditions that are viable for trade, mm -hmm. that encourage um, foreign direct investment, FDR. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love seeing cases where you have China from some European nations coming in and trading, right. but we have to get our products to the point where we can trade internationally. So right now, we are focused a lot on the raw materials. Mm. Get our raw materials out, and then it gets processed in another country. We should be focusing on processing those within our countries. If we do that, then we can compete at, at almost at an equal level, but that raises our ability to compete, and it raises our ability to trade, and that's going to drive in or bring in more investment. So I don't think... Every, I think every nation is looking out for its best interest. And so your question about why America is kind of staying behind. In your opinion, of course, yeah. It is staying. It, it is looking out for its citizens. It's looking right. out for Americans and what's in America's best interest. Mm. We, as Africans or African nations, have to look at what's in our best interest. Right. And if we do that, or we continue to do that, so some countries are doing a great job at it. I and mean, if you look at um, President from Uganda... Okay. The president of Uganda. Mm -hmm. they, they're working, they're doing amazing jobs. They're doing an amazing job in bringing um, a lot of investment. If you look at Ghana, what Ghana is doing today, they have completely changed the landscape as to how they work, how business is done in Africa. And, and they actually, you can see a lot of growth happening in Ghana because they're focusing on ensuring that their people have the opportunity. They're building within and, and enabling trade to happen within Ghana 
and of course in, invite for direct investment. Gotcha. So not every nation is doing that, unfortunately. But mm. the more we start doing it as a as individual countries within the continent, you would see a massive growth. Right, because uh, apparently, as of right now, Africa is only you know a part of the global economy. You know, from a trading standpoint, for only only two percent of the mm-hmm. global economy's trading. So I wanted to get your take on that because I imagine with Balin Spice and you know and your heritage, you you that's something that's important to you to see Africa not just have an opportunity but thrive with that opportunity. So I kind of want to get your take on that. I agree. I agree. I mean, you got something that's completely, you got after my heart right there. <laughs> <laughs> you truly do. You truly do. So just as an aside, my spouse and I have a foundation sure. called Dennis and Lenora Peretia Foundation. Okay. And a lot of what we do is we look at policies that we have within um, Cameroon and across Central Africa and of course it's going to be across the whole continent mm-hmm. and how our different governments can put in place policies that would help improve stuff like just what you're talking about. Right. Help grow, help trade, help investments, you name it. And so we want the African continent to grow. We want to be competitive. We want we want to be at a point where we are trading, engaging with the international market at almost a comparable rate and if not a very comparable rate over time. For sure. And so and I'm saying that goes after my heart because I want that we sh- I want us to get to that level. And we're looking at policies, we're looking at different ways in which we can encourage different governments. And not just the government, but the people. Because the civil society under the government. How do you train people to have the right skills? How do you, how, how do you get a mass movement where people look at, what, at the way they're living and go, we want something different. We want to be able to trade differently. We want to have businesses that work. And so right. we're looking at it from how do you look at policy, but at the same time, how do we get people kind of trained up? And I appreciate you sharing all of that because that's something that has baffled me. Once again, like we see American businesses yeah. starting to make investments in Africa and other. But as far as on a governmental standpoint, we're only seeing like Japan, China, Brazil and some Western. You know, I think the U.S. is kind of starting to do a little bit more, but they're definitely behind those countries. So I kind of want to get your take on that. But what I will say, what I have started to see and it speaks to what you're talking about is that like the the level of startups mm-hmm. and entrepreneurship in Africa appears to be growing. Now, to be fair, I could be being a, a stupid American right now, and it could have been growing for years, but I, at the very least, I know we're starting to see, you know, in the tech space, in the farming space, and other spaces and stuff like that. Let me ask you this question. As an entrepreneur here in the States, how can you be a resource you know, you know, you mentioned your foundation. We have, we'll have you know, information in the show notes for people to check that out as well. What more can you do as a, you know, as a, a entrepreneur here in the states to provide more resources, advice for those startups back in Africa? Yep. So I will talk more for Cameroon, which is the one I know. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. I'll say one of the resources, one of the things I can do. Number one is actually it's not for entrepreneurs, but hire. Okay. So. The beauty of the internet we ha- that mm, we have today absolutely. is anyone can sit anywhere and work. So I don't know if you've heard of things like Fiverr. Yes. Yes, where mm-hmm. you've got people around the world. I can offer employment to people in Cameroon mm-hmm. to work on, for example, social media for my company. I don't have to. I can do that here. I can do that with someone in another country, and I can do that in Cameroon. But in terms of entrepreneurs. I can provide, so one of the things we do, again, this is part of the foundation sure. what I do directly by myself, mm-hmm. but I sponsor some of those things, sure. is provide entrepreneurial skills training. Okay. Provide a platform for people to learn how to manage their businesses. Mm-hmm. The key challenges they're facing, where to find financing, how to build a business from scratch and sustain it. And gotcha. we've been lucky to have some partners. Okay. Who, yeah with the foundation who are helping to sponsor some of those things. But we believe in growing entrepreneurship and I am passionate about women. So if you can get more women into business, you, get, you, you would almost, at least in Cameroon, raise the income level of a lot of women because they don't want to do a lot of the businesses. Gotcha. They don't want to sell in the markets. They don't want to go do farming. So in agriculture is mostly a female um, driven um, was industry. In a lot of the retail sectors, it's a lot of female driven. And so if you can train those women to manage their businesses even better, you make far better entrepreneurs who would then have medium-sized and then large companies. And that would just spiral. That would be a circle that would continuously grow. And that would raise a lot of people out of poverty. 
I can see a lot that I can do as an entrepreneur. Sure. But I can see a lot of as I can do just as a regular individual who may not have been an entrepreneur. For sure. But anyone who is looking to grow entrepreneurship across the spectrum. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. Last question before we go to break. Yeah. You know, many entrepreneurs are always trying to get better. They're, they engage in professional development, things of that nature, reading yes. books, listening to podcasts, wherever the case may be. What's professional development for you look like, Lenore? I listen to a lot of podcasts. Okay. <laughs> it's easy driving, sure. turn it on. Yes, I, I do that. And also, I also listen. I also read a lot of books. Okay. So um, Harvard Business Review. I know it's very MBA style. They have sure. a business review. But it's got some really good information. Mm-hmm. Just as a, it's like strategy, for example. Mm-hmm. What does strategy mean? Yes, they do it at a very high level, but I can take that, like that really high level detail for large businesses and figure out how to do it for my business. Gotcha. Also, you've got um, another thing I read, which I get feeds into my email every day, is like McKinsey Quarterly. Hmm. So McKinsey does little um, bites on things happening around the world. What's, what is happening in China, for example? Sure. How are retailers repositioning oh. their products in China? How are people repackaging? What are the things that are coming up in packaging that may not, may not have been there 10 years ago? Now with the um, influx of people buying a lot online and all this e-commerce trade, how are people changing the way they promote and position their products? I love reading a lot of that. Okay. Again, it's just sign bites. It's some just very quick articles, but it gives me just a sense of what the a pulse, what's happening today in the world. Gotcha. And then I'll say um, one of the podcasts, which... I've been listening to for years is um, it, it is this one by Guy Raz. It's one of how the, I built this. How I built this, mm-hmm. Guy Raz. I right. It it is it's just the nice stories. Absolutely. Listening to people just talk about their journey, where mm-hmm. they started, where they're going. Right. And and the ups and downs. It's it's just a really interesting listen. Very relaxing as I drive home from work or to work. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. So we're gonna go ahead and take a quick break. How you like being on startup life so far? I actually am enjoying it. Okay. And I love looking outside. All right. right. Awesome. All right, Startup Nation. So I hope you're getting great value from Lenora's content, but we got to pay a few bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson. This is the Startup Life Podcast, and it is powered by the Binge Podcast Network. Startup Nation, Kenda and I, along with our daughter Zoe, have this thing called Target Fridays if she's had a good week at school. We stop by the snack bar for popcorn and mermaid ices. Startup Nation, don't judge me until you've tried them. Those ices are really good. Anyways, we then head over to the toy section so my daughter can add to her LOL doll collection. My daughter is a pretty good student, so you can imagine that we have spent a small fortune on LOL dolls. However, I can take solace in the fact that Target makes it affordable to buy those LOL dolls and anything else we need as a family. That's because Target believes you deserve quality at an affordable price. And when you're entrepreneurs like us, that's extremely important. But great deals and quality products are not exclusive to the brick and mortar version of the retail store. Target.com has even more exclusive deals that you can appreciate. And when you spend over $35, shipping is free. And I know we all love free shipping. We love to purchase the amazing kids clothes for Zoe from the exclusive to Target Cat and Jack line when we go online. So the next time you listen to the show and you are reminded that you need something for your home, Start your Target journey with the link in our show notes where you can expect more and pay less. All right, Startup Nation, so let's continue. So, Lenora, if you would, please, man, I just want to talk about Balin Spice. First of all, why that name? <laughs> Balin is a very personal thing. My okay. daughter is called Galen and my son's called Baden. Ah. Take Baden and Galen, 
Balen. Gotcha. And that's why I got Balen Spice. Okay, okay. Yes, it's, it is it is not the best marketing campaign hey, out there for look. a name, but it is the most personal thing I could come up with, hey, that, and I love it. Look, it's yeah. fine by me. Do you plan on, like, like you know, building the company to a point where you leave it to them one day? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking for this to be as large as it can get. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm on the website here and I'm looking at these amazing recipes yes. that you have on here. So if you would <laughs> tell me a little bit about the distinction of African cuisine and stuff like that, just opposed to other ones. Yes. And then just tell us something about some of the recipes you have on here. Okay. So... The beauty of African cuisine is it's different depending on where you are. Okay. So you've got um, Northern Africa, which has a lot of cumin, and then you kind of move to if you go down to the south, mm -hmm. I've got one seasoning that is called peri peri. It's like hot peri peri. Okay. And if you've heard of peri peri chicken, I have. I yes, have. Yes. yes. Peri peri from Southern Africa actually actually means pepper pepper. Hot, hot. Okay. Yes. So, and in South Af in, in Southern Africa, they love a lot of barbecues and grills. And so you do have like seasonings which kind of lend themselves really well to that. Again, if you move more to um, was the Cape Coast in South Africa, okay. they've got this seasoning called Cape Malay. And that actually pulls influences from Asia because you had a lot of the Asian people settle in in, in, in Cape Coast. Okay. So, again, very different flavors. So, it, it, uh, Cape, curry, sorry, Cape Malay kind of tastes like a curry, which would have very similar influences to a curry you'll find in India. Mm -hmm. You go up to Central Africa, where I'm from. So, we at one of the, our big exports is um, penja pepper, which is pepper cones. Again, much hotter pepper cones than you'll find in the U.S. Mm -hmm. White and black pepper, much hotter. Our foods are... We cook a lot with greens, garlics, and gingers. And so you find a lot of those seasonings in more of the central part. When you move to the east, mm -hmm. again, very different from what you find in the west. We use chilies and gingers and garlics. The east does have garlics and gingers as well, but not, but it doesn't have the heat okay. to it. So you look at berber, for example, which is from Ethiopia, which is in East Africa. Mm -hmm. The heat isn't there, but again, it's very deep flavor. So just looking at a continent as a whole... The flavors are completely different if you're north, south, east, or west, or central. Gotcha. And so now comparing that to, as if flavors in other parts, if I had to compare that to flavors in the U.S. or the Western world, it's we have a much richer flavor. I One of the things I struggled with when I first moved to England was the food didn't have that deep spiciness as I was used to having. It was, <laughs> Got you. <laughs> Probably didn't have any seasoning at all, but that's just neither here nor there. <laughs> oh no no! I mean, there's lots of seasoning, but just not the same. Gotcha. Flavor. Fair enough. Fair yes, enough. that I was used to. It's just when they they always joke about English food and stuff like yes. that not having any seasoning. So if I've offended anybody, I do apologize. <laughs> it was a it's a lame attempt at a joke. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then, if you were to compare our deep flavors with more the Asian, let's say the Indian flavors, sure, you would have a kind of similar, I'll say, richness. Gotcha. Yeah, but again, depending on what part of... So if you're looking at East Africa or Southern Africa, like Cape Malay, it will, it will tie in very well with your um, eight, like Indian flavors, with the heat, for the South at least. Understood. The heat and that deep flavor. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, awesome stuff. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm looking on the website, Startup Nation. Once again, you can go to balenspice.com. The link is in the show notes for easy access. And I'm looking at the different type of seasons. you got Ethiopia... Ethiopian curry and steak seasoning and the Tunisian five spice. I think I'm going. I'm just going to go for Raja Hanout. Raja Hanout. Raja Hanout. Yes. Uh, Moroccan all-purpose seasoning. Is the Raja Hanout? Is that kind of like, like seasoned salt almost, or is kind of like an all-purpose where you can kind of put on anything? Tell me a little bit about Raja Hanout. It's an all-purpose seasoning without okay. any salt. Without any. Uh, well, of course, Completely yeah. salt-free. Right. Yes, 100% natural ingredients. Okay. So. Um, Razel Hanout is actually, it talks, it, it's, what it's saying is this is the top of the shelf, the gotcha. best of the best seasons. Okay. So as merchants came in, like spice merchants came in, sure. they would bring all, all kinds of spices that they brought from their travels. Mm -hmm. And the stores would buy and keep the very best at the very top of the shelf. Mm. So when their really good clients came in or really good customers, they would then go up and pull just the best from the top and okay. make a unique blend for their customers. That's what Razel Hanout is a top-of-the-shelf best seasonings. And so 
our version, so my version of Razel Hanout, includes 19 different ingredients. Some of them have been known to have about 100. We're nowhere near there. Mm -hmm. 19. And it does have things like Grits of Paradise, which is in the ginger family, a very unique, I'll say spice, that kind of tastes like pepper, kind of tastes like ginger. It's actually used a lot of ceremonies in um, West Africa and up north. You've got your regular cumin in there, you've got a little bit, a little bit of ginger, um, you've got a mustard. So it's a really good blend. You've got um, rose petals. It's a really good blend of unique flavors that when, when gel together, not only give a beautiful aroma, can make almost anything taste amazing. Gotcha. Put it in your barbecue, put it in a dip. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's literally my best seasoning of all, literally one of my best of everything I carry. Is it your best seller as well? It is my best seller as well. Okay. Yes, all yes, right. it is my best seller. And, and I, I, I love the packaging, you know, from not just the casing, but also the label as well, because I'm looking at it on the website and you even have, I guess, it's kind of like a marker where in Africa yep. the, the spice comes from. I think that's kind of cool. And I think that's kind of speaking to the blog post again. It's like th there you are educating about Africa a little bit. So I see there's kind of a, a constant theme, not just from the blog post, but from the actual product itself, which I can appreciate for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole goal is to, number one, educate people, raise awareness, and get them to want to try it, want to taste it. For sure. So by telling people where it is, mm -hmm. it's, it's one thing to say Morocco. Sure. How many people know where Morocco is? Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> but they know what the African map looks like, right? Sure. Yes. And so if you can put a pin to say, this is North Africa pin, that's where you find Morocco. It, it, it connects the consumer with the location. And now they can even go back and do a bit more research on Morocco to understand a bit sure. more. Yes. And then I literally put, so on the, all the labels, it's just a little caption on how to use it. Mm -hmm. So again, just a little bit, a little tidbit about these are great the spices, but how do you use it? Sure. And then of course, list all the ingredients. But then I, I do agree with you. Education is key. Absolutely. Many people do not know what African seasonings are. Mm -hmm. They don't know, they cannot name a few African seasonings or spices. Right. And one thing I found is people, some people call Africa a country versus mm, a continent. Yeah. Yes. And so <laughs> by just telling them we have, what, 53 different countries within this massive continent, in right. the sense of Africa, is like much larger than the U.S. Right. So by just making people understand that how vast this continent is and how uniquely different each part and each country is. It's, I think it's a really good way to educate people on not just the continent, but then where the different spices come from. And it could help connect them to that location and help them enjoy the foods. Coming back to education as well, we have very, very easy recipes. Okay. I believe in very simple. Three steps, four if we're pushing it. Mm. I love to cook, but I don't love to spend around 30 minutes in the kitchen. Okay. I want my family to have a really delicious meal, but I won't kill myself in there. Fair enough. I, I will not. <laughs> Fair enough. And so... I think there's a lot of people out there who want quick and easy meals that taste delicious mm -hmm. for themselves, for their families, for their friends, when people come over. And so the recipes I've got on the website, mm -hmm. literally I go to that. So for example, if you look at the, I've, I've got a salmon seasoning on there, a salmon recipe. Right. It's very quick. You put your seasoning onto the salmon, stick it in the oven, pull it out. Same thing with um, the Moroccan seasoning. It's you get your lamb, you put a tablespoon of the razel hanout, a little bit of olive oil, wrap it up, stick it in the oven. Once it's done, you take it out. The juice is kind of cooking with it. Mm -hmm. Of course, you put as much salt as you want. Right. And that's it. You have your lamb ready. Your rice is in the rice cooker. It's a very easy meal. Right. So it's a... Uh, I believe in educating people on how to use the seasonings, but at the same time, make it so easy that it's... Why not? Just... Try it and enjoy it. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. And I, and I love on the label how you're you're very transparent about what's in when inside. And I think yes. in a very health conscious era that we're in, that that's very important and adds value to your product. So yes. I, I appreciate that. And Startup Nation, once again, you go to BaileySpice.com. We have a link in the show notes for easy access. And I tell you, just looking on this uh, computer screen, though, those recipes look amazing. They are they look, delicious. I, be, I bet they are. They look delicious. I'm just going to give one thing. Sure, go for it. When I do demos, yeah. I usually go with the Razel Hanout. Okay. And just, again, very easy recipe. I take a teaspoon, put in about a pound of chicken, mm -hmm. um, let it sit with some olive oil and salt mm -hmm. in a fridge for about an hour, and then slow cook it. Mm. So it's very low heat. So I add no water, so I let the juices from the chicken kind of cook itself with the seasoning. 
And, and it goes in. And I tell you, I usually come home with nothing left for my demo. <laughs> people, I mean, I've had people go, can I have more? Right. <laughs> like, this is a demo, you know, right? Right. <laughs> I'm not feeding a nation, but it's... <laughs> right. <laughs> but people love it. And so it, it, just, it just goes to the beauty and the quality of the ingredients. And just the fact that it's so much health. It, it's that healthy. Right. But again, it's got this great, great aromas. Together, just gives this really quick and easy meal that you can feed your kids, your family, you name it. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful seasoning. Awesome stuff. Where, where can we purchase your seasonings yes. and spices? Yes. Mm-hmm. So today, you can get them from the Cordoba's Farmer's Market. Okay. The Winchester Farmer's Market. Okay. You've got it out in the Curb Market. You do have it at Miss Cordelia's. Mm-hmm. Also, Super Low in um, Spotsville. Okay. Just um, pulled it up. And we also got it in Ducks Wine and Spirit, Ducks Wine Spirits and more, out in Germantown. Okay. And lastly, we just got a delivery to um, out in New York, to um, Sergeant Pepper. Nice. Yes. Nice. Okay. And, and Amazon as well. Before I forget, you can, all I see things are available on Amazon. I got you. All right. Cool. I'm, I'm glad you you said that because uh, we have many people who don't live in Memphis and so yes. that listen to the show. So yeah, so you can get that on Amazon. Absolutely. And we we have a link in the show notes for easy access for you to purchase these amazing, beautiful, uh, with a beautiful packaging, but, you know, very great tasting spices from Lenora and her company, Baylor Spice, and from Baylor Spice. Can they purchase directly from the website as well? Or they just can as well. Okay. They can as well, yes. So um, okay. we do sell as well directly from, this, from the website. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Thank you for sharing. And we have all those links in the show notes for easy access. So, you know, we have a mutual fan in Gary. We mentioned him a little bit earlier and stuff yeah. like that. But just talk about Gary and the... The, the help he has provided you there at SCORE? Gary has been amazing, mm-hmm. and he continues to be amazing. Awesome. So Gary is my sponsor at sure. SCORE. Uh-huh. I remember I emailed SCORE saying, I'm, I'm about to start his business and want to speak with someone, and Gary responded. Had our first meeting, and he is a cheerleader. Mm. I presented my idea to him, and he immediately went, I think this is going to work. And by then, I had only been in one store. So Gary and I kind of spoke about where this was going, what my plans were. He offered to look at my business plan and have someone else look at it to mm-hmm. like independently critique it from a business lens right. as to how feasible is this business plan. Gary also connected me with Jennifer, who then put me in touch with another lady called Lisa, mm-hmm. who has a lot of connections within stores and restaurants. So one thing I just almost forgot. Sure. You can also, um, Napa Cafe actually uses the seasonings as well. Okay. In their restaurants. So okay. another place where you can enjoy fully cooked food using bale and spice. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. L- let's go back to being in the stores a little bit. Talk about that process of getting into the store, what the pitch sound like, you know, how to go through that process. Because we have many people yeah. who have food products and stuff like that, and they want to get in the stores, but they don't know how to go about that process. Kind of share your insight on that a little bit. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes. Of course. Um, I am not a salesperson per se. Okay. I'm going to put that caveat. Okay. And so I've partnered with someone who can make that sales pitch much sure. easier. What I found has helped is telling a story to the store. Mm, absolutely. So going in there with a story, explaining who you're targeting. So it's, it's, it's one thing to say, I've got this really great seasoning, try it. But who is your target audience? Because if, if that doesn't completely fit with the store, then they won't take your product because the wrong people are coming to their stores or the wrong people would, would not buy your product. Gotcha. So it's great to identify who you want to buy your product and who you do not want to buy your product. Mm-hmm. That's one thing we never think about because we a lot of I, when I started I kind of went oh, I want everyone to buy it right but the truth is not everyone will buy it and so who are the people you truly want to buy your seasoning and once you identify that identify the stores where those people shop and so it's an easy conversation then with Absolutely. the store to say hey I have this really great product and this is who from my research is looking for something like this your clientele fits this mm-hmm. if we were to Try it out. A lot of times what I've done is actually test out the product in the stores. Sure. So gone in there with a few, like six bottles, had it on shelf, and when it sold well, then I've been called back to bring more. Gotcha. So offer a test out period versus come buy this entire case. And if they're willing to just try you out, that is brilliant. So what I've done that in, in the case where they've agreed to try us out is put the seasonings on there and do as much. like So have shelf talkers to attract people's attention, have all the benefits listed up very clear. For example, no salt, no GMO, local, things that will grab people's attention. Have that on shelf so as people walk by, they can go, hmm, 
this is new and make it look colorful. Mm. The last thing you want is something white that fades in the background. Right. Something that stands out. People can go, yes, I can see this. And so what I found has worked in the stores. Number one is getting a story, very clear story, offering just to test it out. Being and making sure that your product matches the your product aligns with the um the store. So in terms of who's who the clientele is and who your target audience is. Right. And yeah. another thing which has helped is just demoing. So mm. doing a demo in the store of your product. Right. That helps you, that helps them. You sell it to them at a also the, the entrepreneur or the business owner sells it to them at the wholesale price. Right. They're selling at the retail price. Right. So when you come in and dedicate and give your time two, three hours to talk about the product, sell it to clients walking in, introduce it, give them something to taste, build that awareness. That helps the store because they're selling while you're there, number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, when you leave, people now know about the product and they're more likely to come back and buy it. Gotcha. And so the store is happy, you're happy, the chances of you getting more business tremendously increase. I hear that. I hear that. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. So I, I want to ask you this. Now, I imagine since you've been here in the States, you eat different types of food, try different types of food as well. Yeah. What, are, what are some of those different types of food? We're going to play a game a little bit, but I need to know what types of food first. <laughs> what types of food I've tried yeah. since I moved here? Mm-hmm. Well, I say since I moved to Memphis, I tried the chicken salad chick. God, that, oh. that is delicious. That is delicious chicken salad. You're speaking about soul salad. right there. I, I had never <laughs> tasted chicken salad that good. Right. Speaking <laughs> about know, soul right, right I'm there. I know, right? I'm getting promotion it's, it's for that meeting, but God, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely tried that. Okay. Um, barbecue. Barbecue. So I, okay. I had eaten barbecue before. So I'd had, I thought barbecue was only ribs. Mm-hmm. That was my idea of barbecue. Ah. And I come here and... Oh, we put barbecue on everything. Oh, I found that out. <laughs> <laughs> barbecue on everything in Memphis, so... I learned that. <laughs> and there's so many nice barbecue places. That's true. So, um, where was this? Two weeks ago, we didn't want to cook. And kids had eaten. They kind of gone to bed. My spouse and I were sitting there like, we want barbecue. So, I drove out at like maybe 10 o'clock. Because mm-hmm. he, he he was literally on call, so he couldn't go. Gotcha. So, I literally drove out. Got literally a massive rack of barbecue like ribs. Mm-hmm. Oh, delicious. Came home and we're like, yes, this is Memphis eating. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Okay. We enjoyed that, yeah. So in terms of new foods, mm-hmm. I heard, of course, I tasted barbecue before, but right. nothing as good as here. Gotcha. Chicken salad, oh my God. Right. Nothing but chicken salad. Okay. Yeah, I, I would, I mean, if there's a way to take it everywhere, I would, but I just can't. Yeah, so foods like that, I've definitely tried and enjoyed. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you had to, to pick one or the other, Mm-hmm. And you had to eat it for the rest of your life, whether it be barbecue or chicken salad chick. I'll take the barbecue. The barbecue. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Chicken's great. Chicken's delicious. <laughs> but at 2 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> when you really want that quick fix of really delicious food, I, and the reason I'll go for barbecue is the rich flavor. Okay, yeah. So that ties very much back to what for I keep sure. eating. For sure. And so that deep flavor in the, in the meat having been brewed, I mean, having been, like, soaked in whatever flavors for hours, Mm -hmm. you can taste that to the bone. Right. And so, if I could eat only one thing for the rest of my life, believe me, I'll take that barbecue rib with me (laughs) as far as I can go. Gotcha. Well, that that's one that's yeah. that, that's that's something we're definitely known for here in Memphis. Uh, rock and roll, blues, and barbecue. So yes. yeah, that's definitely. Yes. So what what was the tastiest thing you had that you didn't realize you that you know that we barbecued? What's the tastiest thing outside of ribs? What's the the tastiest thing? It was this. It was like a pork pool. Pulled pork. It? Something, yeah. Or pulled chicken or something like that? It wasn't chicken, it was like pork. It was, it was like pulled, something pulled, yeah. Pulled pork, yeah. Yes, okay. yeah. yeah. I, I wouldn't have ordered it at all. I, I was going to say, no, no, I'm not going to taste that. <laughs> I was going to go pass. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Awesome stuff. Yes, and then I had just like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. This is good. Gotcha. Thank yeah. you for sharing all of that for sure. So I want to ask you this. You know, I believe all entrepreneurs have an entrepreneurial superpower. What's yours and why? Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, superpower. Mm-hmm. And if your kids ask, I'll back you up on this one. I would say my superpower is, sad as it is, analysis. Okay. I could analyze stuff for ages. I hear that. It's look at who's saying what, what, and that's why I, get, that's why I gather so much information when I do demos. Sure. I ask people I, all questions because I can use that to inform decisions I make. Example I'll give you is the labels today. Mm. I started off with just plain white labels with like strips of color. 
And I thought that was clean, unique, look like very clean looking, not too busy. Gotcha. But just by speaking to people and, and not just analyzing what they said, but in their body language. Because when someone's in front of you, they're more likely to say things that are positive. Right. What do you think about this? Oh, I think it's good. Ah, something <laughs> out there may not sound too right. <laughs> just the way you said it, I can tell something's kind of a little bit off. Gotcha. And so just, so I, I would say my superpower is analysis. Like just okay. looking at what people say, how they do, what they do, what data is out there. I would just soak it all up and turn out information that's useful for me. Okay. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Thank you so much. And for much. my business, of course. For sure. For sure. So before I ask the last question, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the Start of Life podcast, powered by the Binge Podcast Network. You gave amazing value from uh, not only, you know, about the story of your business and stuff like that, but also talking about, you know, finding that target market, how to get in the stores and stuff like that. So I appreciate all of that. And also some of those those health standards and stuff that we talked about earlier, because we have many people who think about diving into the food space and entrepreneurship. But now I'm going to turn the microphone over to you because there's an entrepreneur out there who's feeling stuck in their business or they're afraid to start. Give them some words of motivation today in order to help them keep moving forward. If you're afraid to start, the question is, how would you feel 10 years from now if you did try? What legacy do you want to leave for yourself? When you're being put into that casket, unfortunately, we're all going to die. What do you want people to remember about you? Of course, we have all the things on our personal life. We want to be great people, loving wives, loving husbands, um, have great children. But then for that accomplishment that has been, I literally have been at the back of your mind for so many years. How do you want people to remember you with, in regards to that accomplishment? Do you want people to say, oh, they had this great idea and, well, life got in the way. Or they had this great idea and in spite of life getting in the way, they did everything they could to get it. I think, personally, I would go for the latter. If you're stuck, think about what you want, where you want to be in 10 years and how you're going to treat yourself in 10 years. Or on your dying bed, would you be happy with the choices you made? Wow. I think I just heard a mic drop somewhere. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. I appreciate that. And that's going to wrap up this session of The Startup Life. Did you enjoy being on the show? Absolutely. I've been laughing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hi, Startup Nation. If you want to let us know what you think about our show, have an idea for a show topic, or would like to advertise on our show, send us a message on the Startup Life Podcast Facebook page. And while you are there, like and follow our page as well. It's a great way for us to engage with you, Startup Nation, and really grow our community. The link is there in the show notes. Subscribe to the show as it can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or even on your Facebook timeline or any other platform you like to get your podcast. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. You can also listen to the show on the Startup Life Podcast new website. There you will find the all new startup blog where I write on many topics that are interesting and helpful to you on your path to entrepreneurship. And hey, If you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life.